welcome. Uh, well, we're extremely happy to have Paul and Alex to brief us on the US presidential election primary. Uh, just a few points. Uh, I'm Robert Dijarek, by the way, from Temple University. Uh, if you're not on our email list, you can give me or one of our student workers. Hello? Uh, um, your business card and also if you want to support our programs you can put something in our ballot box which is actually our contribution box as I said once we gathered a total of 340 yen from all of you so uh, we hope that at least to, this time we'll get 350 uh, if not we and so we well that you have to ask Moncasho uh, to allow us to become a Gakko Hojin in a way that is uh, compatible with our mission. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Paul will start on a kind of more technical analysis of the election and then Alex will look at the policy implications including those for Asia. So Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for coming tonight. Nice audience. The last time I was in Tokyo was about a year and a half ago, and I was talking about um, the upcoming midterm elections. And I was right, but that was a very easy election to be right about. As I was here at that point, all of the quantitative information, all of the metrics were pointing in the same direction. Um, political scientists had always known that um, the power and the, the party in power. Um, during off-year elections almost always lose seats. So the only question was how bad would it be in 2010? And we were already getting some signs even while I was here that it was going to be very bad for the Democrats. And it turned out to be very, very bad for the Democrats in 2010. Presidential elections are always different. And this year is really um, a difficult year. You know, to, to get to sort of the end of the story, if I was going to put a bet on this election um, and you wouldn't give me any odds, I would bet on President Obama being reelected. Um, that seems to be the indication. But it's difficult, uh, and we'll sort of talk about why a little bit. <clears throat> Presidential elections are always, as I said, a little bit hard um, to predict. They're always a little, not, not a straight line. This is 2008, and I wanted to show you this. What, what this is is basically aggregated data. These are all the polls that we had um, in 2008, you know, combined together to sort of give us a running average. And we're, we are poll happy in the United States. We, we poll constantly, every day, multiple organizations. It's a good thing for people like me because you have an enormous amount of data, a lot of numbers to go. But what I wanted to show you is I think oftentimes we forget what elections are really like. And we think that 2008 was easy, um, that we knew all along that Barack Obama was going to be elected president. But what I'm trying to show you is if you were just looking at poll data in 2008, that's not necessarily the conclusion you would draw. Right here, right here is about the um, time of the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. They were tied um, coming out of there. It was anyone's election coming out of the convention. Um, really what happened in 2008 was the economic crisis in the United States. And you can correlate it with the stories in the newspaper about the economy. Um, in fact, th this um, chart is actually from an article that, that looked at that and correlated it very well um, with stories in the newspaper about the economy <coughs> and how the election split. So it was, the election was about the economy in 2008, and that's why Barack Obama won, because people decided he would be a better manager for the US economy than John McCain. <coughs> so that's where we were at um, with that. looking at a couple, a number of factors in trying to predict what's going to happen in 2012. And the first obvious thing to look at is incumbency, meaning the, somebody who's already in office, and looking at incumbent presidents and how often they get reelected. Uh, it's a very sort of simple, simple measure. Uh, since World War II, I sort of chose World War II because it's the beginning of the modern presidency with Roosevelt. If you throw Roosevelt in the mix, it makes it, it, it skews your numbers, right? Because he gets reelected and reelected and reelected. Um, so we're taking, we're starting after Roosevelt with Truman um, up to the present. 
So we've got 16 elections um, since then, and nine incumbents, nine people that were already in office. <clears throat> of those, seven of nine won re-election. So if you just look at that, it looks like almost all the time incumbents get re-elected. And so if Barack Obama is an incumbent, he's going to get re-elected. Now, the, the fact is, even looking at those, you can't really say re-elected with all of them. Because, you know, with President Truman, with President Johnson, with President Ford, they're all incumbents, but they had never been elected. Um, they had succeeded to office in each case. So if you take them out of the mix as people who had never been elected and re-elected, uh, you're down to only six. <coughs> And you know now Barack Obama would be one of those, would be seven. Um, up until this point, five of the six are re-elected. So again, it looks fairly certain that in the United States, we re-elect incumbents. You know, of the people who had been elected, um, who were not re-elected. I'm sorry, Bush one was not re-elected. We knew it was part of it. Four of six, sorry. Um, my numbers might be wrong, must be wrong. But you get the idea. Yeah. Um, most of the, I apologize, most of the time these incumbents are re-elected. Um, that's what it looks like should happen. Um, Nate Silver from the New York Times looked at it all the way back to the Civil War and found that 73% of incumbents were re-elected. Another factor to look at is division, divisive primaries. Uh, and looking at whether if a political party has a very divisive or divided primary, um, what that does for their prospects in the election. And political scientists have found, without very good data, that a divisive primary is bad. So if the parties are really fighting with each other in the primary, that hurts party unity and makes it difficult for that party to win. Of course, the reason we're looking at that this year is the Republicans have a very nasty primary going on. And so that looks very good for Barack Obama. Now, <clears throat> that's a little bit difficult um, to always say whether it's true or not, also. Because, you know, if you look in 2004, the Democratic Party did not have a very difficult primary. Um, John Kerry settled it within about six weeks and he lost the election. Um, in 2008, the Democrats went for six months before they arrived at a nominee, and they won the election. So simply saying that a very divisive primary is necessarily bad for a political party, it's not necessarily true um, as you move forward. It could be that actually it keeps the party in the news. Um, it gets a lot of publicity for whoever the eventual nominee is. You know, if this Republican nomination had been over in March, we wouldn't be talking that much um, about Mitt Romney right now. Um, people would sort of be on hold until the, until the convention and the nomination, but we are talking a lot about them in the United States. So you could argue it might even be a positive um, to have a divisive primary. The Republicans um, really set themselves up for a divisive primary this year. This is a chart, this is from Real Clear Politics, if some of you go in there. And each of these colored lines represents a different Republican candidate. And <coughs> their relative um, poll numbers with regard to the other. So what you see is they've been all over the place. You know, the rise of each one as they get knocked down. And so it's been a really up and down primary. Um, the Republicans guaranteed they would have a difficult year this year by, for some reason, changing their rules in 2008. Um, right after the 2008 convention. And actually, it was at the meeting at the 2008 convention that they decided to do it this way. Republicans had always had basically no rules. Um, if you know anything about the Republican Party in the United States, they don't like centralized control. And they had exhibited that in how they ran their primaries. Basically, they told the state parties, do it however you want to do it. We don't really care. And most states and the Republicans had gone winner take all. So if you win one more vote than anybody else in the state, you get all of their delegates. Michael Steele, who was the Republican chair back in 2008, decided this wasn't a good thing because Republicans ended their primaries too quickly. So he came up with this great idea of how to extend it, which is to go with what the Democrats do, really, which is 
proportionality. And they mandated that in all the early primaries, primaries before April, that every state had to at least have some element of proportionality in, in it. And if you read the rules, they're very vague. They don't tell you exactly what that means. But somehow, the percentage of delegates has to be at least remotely related to the percentage of votes that somebody gets. So that basically guaranteed it. Now, Democrats, as I said, had done this for a long time, since 1976. Democrats were doing proportional allocation of delegates. But they figured out by about 1984, that, or 1980 really, that this didn't always work out very well. So they invented something we call superdelegates now. Um, PLEOs is the, is the common name. Um, basically elected officials, uh, political leaders and elected officials, PLEOs. And 20% of those who attend the Democratic National Convention go there no matter what happens in the primaries. So if the Democrats were to run into a problem like the Republicans, where no one can reach 50% of the delegates, they've got these elected leaders who can just weigh in on one side or the other and declare who the nominee is going to be. And technically, Barack Obama became the nominee because of the pleos, uh, not because he won a majority of delegates in 2008. He didn't in the actual elected delegates. But the pleos came in, the superdelegates. But Republicans don't really have those. They've got about 160, some of them, who go by virtue of their position. But even some of those, about 50 or so, are actually committed by the results of the state primaries. So they don't have any way to solve this problem. Um, this chart here is just, I chose my state, Ohio, to give you a sense of how complicated um, you know, this can be. Um, in Ohio, for example, there are 66 um, delegates. And the way they arrive at this number is really fascinating. If you're really interested in politics, um, you can read each state's rules. But you get a certain amount for the number of electoral votes you get. You get a, if you're Republicans, you get a certain amount if you have one house of the state legislature, two houses of the state legislature, Republican governor, if you have Republican members of Congress. These are all sort of bonus <coughs> delegates, they're saying. So that's how they arrive at this number of 66. Um, of those, only 63 have alternates because there's no alternates for the party officials. And there's three party officials that go from Ohio. Um, and this is just an example of sort of the complexity um, of this. Um, these are the congressional district delegates. So there's 48 of them, three for each of the 16 congressional districts. And so they essentially hold separate elections in each congressional district to win these three delegates. It's enormously complex as you go through it. And every state has their own rules. So if you really want to understand this and analyze this, you actually have to read the rules for each state. And few of us have the patience, I think, to do that. But that's what's going on now as we're going through it. And, and honestly, many of us are learning as we're going along. I think we're surprised um, every sort of week at some new set of rules that we weren't quite aware of. And even when they go to the convention with this, the Republicans have some fights coming up because Rick Santorum is saying that he's going to challenge what some states did. So for example, Florida. <clears throat> well, Florida went too early. They broke RNC rules because they weren't supposed to go as early as they went. And they've been penalized. They took away half their delegates. But Florida also went winner take all, um, which you weren't allowed to do. Now, Rick Santorum argued that, wait a minute, you violated the rules. Florida says, who cares? Right? We, we already got penalized. We lost half our delegates. So we can, if we break one rule, we can break them all. But Santorum says, no, you can break one rule. It doesn't mean you can break them all. So they could have this really interesting fight coming up. Also, the Republican rule was proportionality before April. But if you start looking at it, Texas, which has 150 some delegates, is going all proportional, even though they're going in April. Um, and California, which I believe goes early June, um, is, I think, mostly proportional. It's somewhat confusing, but something like 80% of their delegates are going to be proportional. So that's what makes it seem as if maybe it won't end as soon as we think. Because even though you know, Mitt Romney could run the table now, Rick Santorum is going to get a lot of delegates going forward. And it might make it difficult for Romney to actually accumulate a majority. What this does in November, we don't know, because it's never really happened before. So we don't know what this will do to the Republican Party or how it will help um, Barack Obama. <clears throat> Presidential approval is another thing that you might look at in trying to predict the election. How popular is the president? And we ask this question, we've been asking it for a long time. Um, do you approve of the president's performance? 
if you look at the number and the result, uh, whether the president won or lost, right, it appears that there's a breaking point right here, um, right around 49, 48%. That if you're above 49, you get reelected. If you're below 49, you lose the election. But all the time when you're doing this, your N, right, your, your data set is too small. Um, so you really can't, I think, make definite predictions. You can just show the numbers. Now the problem with predicting this election is trying to figure out exactly where Barack Obama is on his approval number, because the polls are not all matching up. And then figuring out whether that really matters in that. I mean, the Gallup poll today was 46%. So that would look like he's in pretty bad shape because you know, other presidents that have been down here haven't been reelected. Of course, you know, you've got only Gerald Ford at that number. These two are well below. So difficult um, to sort of use that number. I want to go quickly now. Uh, I'm sorry. The, when I did the PowerPoint, it, it worked out a little, more, a little better. It looked a little better than this. But it just shows you that um, you know the approval numbers. Look, just look at the total, the total approval number, and at 41 percent, um, pretty <coughs> low. And you know this is a New York Times CBS News poll. The New York Times is not known as being a very conservative organization. So they're not going to intentionally um, be against Barack Obama in this. So you probably think that this is a pretty accurate poll. And that's a pretty low number. So I told you Gallup's at 46. Everything, though, seems to be pretty low. The same poll, though, showed Obama beating Romney 49 to 41. And if you look at the aggregate of the polls, that's pretty much where it is nationally right now, that Romney is losing 41 um, to 49. So the approval numbers show he's not going to get reelected. The overall reelect number is showing he is. Just shows you the sort of stability of the of the this is Gallup poll data over time. Uh, unemployment. Uh, final thing, sort of we can look at to see whether a president's going to get reelected or not. And again, you look at the unemployment numbers and you see whether the president um, was reelected or not. The prediction for the unemployment rate for President Obama in October is 7.7% which is lower than it is now. And we're assuming that Europe doesn't blow up and you know, there's not a war with Iran or something and all those things could, could bump up unemployment. But assuming none of that happens, we think it's probably going to be 7.7%. Uh, um, at that number, it doesn't look very good, right? Gerald Ford, 7.7, loses. Jimmy Carter, 7.5, loses. So that number looks kind of bad in that people who have lower unemployment didn't get reelected. So if you're just looking at that number, again, not good news for the president. But then look at this, which is trends. What direction is unemployment going? And this looks really clear, right? If unemployment is dropping, this should be a curve, right? But it's not. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. With, and that's sort of the percent margin of victory. You'd think if unemployment was really going down, your margin would be really high. But that's not really what it shows. But it certainly shows <coughs> unemployment goes down, you win. If unemployment goes up, you lose. Um, unemployment's going down now, and pretty significantly. So if that's the case, again, it looks like the president is in pretty good shape. So those are the numbers. Some show he shouldn't get reelected. Some show that he that he um, he shouldn't or he won't. So we'll have to see what it what um what it brings. But that's what I have for you now. I'll take your questions after Alex. Thanks a lot, Uh, in our U.S. politics and our uh, Asia practice, 
Uh, their advice and uh, suggestions as I've been putting this presentation together have been uh, very helpful uh, in sort of gathering my thoughts about uh, where things uh, seem to be headed. So let me first talk a little bit about uh, the primary. Um, and, you know, my views uh, on, on this are, are really not that far off from from, uh, from Paul's, just in the sense that, you know, the the structure of the Republican primary this year has uh, sort of given the opportunity for there to be a lot more of a contest between the presumed front runner from the beginning, uh, Romney, uh, versus the the other candidates, Santorum, Gingrich, uh, and Ron Paul. Um, in the end, however. Santorum is going to be the nominee. It, it, it looks pretty certain that that, or I'm sorry, Romney. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, uh, Romney is going to be the, the, the nominee. Uh, I, I think the key here really is to look at the, the delegate counts, where they are right now, uh, and where they will end up. Uh, even, if, uh, even if Romney does not end up with the 1,144 delegates that he needs uh, to wrap up the nomination by the end of June, when the primaries end. And it, it is entirely possible that that could happen. Um, uh, he will still have uh, significant momentum going into the convention. Uh, and I think what we're starting to see now, after the Illinois primary this week, uh, is that the uh, sort of the top levels of the Republican Party are starting to coalesce uh, around Romney's candidacy and around his nomination. And I think that's going to be very important. So former governor of Florida, Jeb Bush, uh, his endorsement of Romney uh, this week, I think was important uh, to that effort. And then what that does is that helps him to build momentum, to cement his, his position as the front runner uh, in the election going forward, and to take that into the remaining primaries uh, going forward. Uh, now, there will be proportional primaries uh, uh, in the next couple of months, but there also will be these winner-take-all primaries. And I think that will be important. Uh, for helping to build that momentum uh, going uh, into the convention. Nevertheless, uh, it is clear that uh, some of the candidates, uh, particularly Gingrich, uh, but maybe also Santorum, will stay in this race through to the end. Uh, and that is going to have implications, I think, for the general election uh, in terms of, of Romney's ability to move from appealing to conservative voters who are very important to the uh, Republican primary process uh, to appealing to moderates uh, and independent voters, which will be very important uh, for the general election. Um, I think the, the sort of the extended campaign has made that more difficult for Romney, uh, and that will be an issue for him uh, going forward. We can talk a little bit more in the Q and A session about some of the details of the convention and the possibility of a broker convention. I don't think that that's likely, um, but it is something that I think has uh, caused a lot of interest uh, out there. But let's talk a little bit about the election. Um, and like Paul, if you know, if the election, you know, if I had to make a call today, I would say that Obama is more likely to win. Um, it's but it's a very close race. Um, you know, if you look at the the polls showing Obama versus Romney, it's very close, with anywhere from three to five to seven points, depending on the polls uh, that you look at. Uh, and that's. Uh, you know, that's even after a fairly bruising primary campaign uh, for Romney. Now, you know, I think, you know, the, the issues of incumbency are, are uh, is one of the biggest advantages that, that Obama has, one of the reasons why it seems like it, it, that it's more likely uh, that he would win the election at this stage. Another big issue, I think, for another big advantage for him right now, at least, is the state of the economy. Uh, where you have economic data that's starting to show uh, signs of improvement, uh, unemployment data show, starting to show signs of improvement, so that it is very high, and that's a, that's a problem for, for Obama. And it's going to be a problem for him throughout the election campaign. Uh, but the trends have been more positive uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the economy, and I think that, that does help him uh, going forward. Uh, it also presents a challenge to Romney, because Romney's campaign, probably his biggest strength, um, and the argument that we'll hear the most from him is about his ability to, to run the U.S. economy. Um, you know, he, Santorum has been campaigning very much on, on social issues, for example. Uh, Romney's campaign has been very much about economic issues. Uh, if the economy is improving, if the trend lines are getting better, and if the public 
believes that the economy is moving in the right direction, um, then that presents a real, a real problem for Romney uh, in the general election to try and build momentum uh, for his campaign. Uh, now, on the other hand, I, I, I mentioned before, you know, for Romney, one of the big challenges will be trying to move to the center um, to try and appeal to moderates and independents during the general election campaign. Uh, it, it's going to be difficult for him, given the primary, but it's not impossible. Uh, and I think, you know, I, you know, I, I think as we, you know, as he moves forward, uh, and it, as it becomes clear that he's the front runner in the GOP primary, he's going to start shifting his rhetoric. We're already seeing this uh, to a certain degree, but he'll be shifting his rhetoric more uh, to talk about Obama uh, and uh, sort of his critique of Obama, rather than having to address uh, uh, his opponents uh, in the primary. That will help him to start to shift to the center a little bit. There will be a problem, I think, for him uh, between now and August, however, where he will need to continue to sort of show conservatives uh, that he uh, does uh, believe in the issues that are important to them. Uh, but some of the polls on that look are starting to look more favorable for him, uh, where conservatives, conservative voters are now starting to say, uh, to, ha to have a more favorable impression of Romney than they had earlier in the primary. Um, for him, that will work to his advantage in terms of being able to start to make that shift uh, towards the center. So it, it's, it's a difficult task, but it's not an impossible task for him. And I think over time, we'll start to see moderates and independents uh, who have had, I, I would say, a, a more unfavorable view of Romney in the last couple of months. I think that view is going to start to shift. So it's going to become easier for him uh, to deal with that uh, as it gets closer to, uh, closer to the convention and then into the general election campaign uh, in September. Um, you know, I, I think you know, the, the key here in terms of the election, you know, it's always difficult calling an election, you know, six, seven months out, because there are so many things that could affect um, uh, the, the election campaign going forward. And there are a lot of you know, really big question marks about where things are headed uh, in a number of areas. So let me just highlight a couple of, of key things to watch uh, during the general election campaign. The economy is going to be issue number one, uh, and it really is not clear, you know, that this economic recovery. Um, that, you know, that we'll see this, you know, the trends continue to improve. Um, I mean, that people are starting to talk more positively about where the economy is headed. But if there was a downturn, if there was, for example, uh, uh, particular problems with the European economy uh, that then had an effect on the U.S. Um, and you know, led to, to the more negative numbers on, on the U.S. economy, that becomes a big problem uh, for Obama heading forward. And it, and it helps Romney in terms of his main campaign message, which is going to be about uh, the economy. So that will be, I think, a key one to watch uh, uh, for this campaign. You know, foreign policy is probably going to factor less than domestic policy in this campaign, simply because I mean, the public is just more focused on domestic policy issues and especially on the economy. But Iran, I would say, is a big exception uh, to that um, for a couple of reasons. One, I think, you know, you have a number of uh, conservatives and, and the presidential candidates who've taken a very tough line on Iran and the Ira Iranian nuclear program. Uh, and I think with the Iraq war uh, winding down, with uh, troops now starting to be uh, pulled out of Afghanistan, Republicans will be looking at the Iranian issue much more. Uh, and I think the Iran nuclear issue resonates with the American public more than, say, the North Korean nuclear issue. So I, you know, while I think we will hear some about North Korea during the campaign, probably won't hear that much. But Iran, we might. And one of the one of the reasons is that this can have an effect on energy prices, which is another big issue that I think we'll have to be focused on uh, during this campaign, and that the candidates will will uh, will be talking about quite a bit. In part because the Republican uh, primary candidates have already sort of laid the groundwork for that. In the last few weeks, there's been a lot of talk about high gas prices uh, in the U.S., partly related to the Ira Iranian issue, but the Republicans are tying this into President Obama's energy policies. Uh, now, you know, it, obviously, it's not quite clear where, ga where gasoline prices will be headed throughout the summer. But typically, what we what we see is a spike around Memorial Day, which is considered the start of the summer driving season in the U.S., and then we see another spike uh, around Labor Day, which is considered to be sort of the end of the summer driving season. Um, 
and so I think you will see a lot of activity at, at both those points. Um, but the Labor Day point, I think, will be will be particularly important. So if gas prices are particularly high uh, in certain parts of the U.S. around Labor Day, you will see uh, Romney making a very big deal about this. Um, and there's evidence that the Obama campaign and the administration are really reacting to this. So we've seen some statements on energy policy, speeches on energy policy, uh, moves on uh, uh, the Keystone Pipeline, which has become something of a controversial issue uh, uh, for the president uh, recently. The Iranian issue kind of feeds into that. If you know, the risk of, of military action against Iran this year is still relatively low. But it doesn't take military action to create sort of uh, concerns, tension uh, that can then be reflected in oil markets and then can have an impact on the gasoline price. So uh, the Iranian issue can then play into the gas price issue if we were to see tensions ratchet up over Iran, uh, threats over uh, t oil tanker traffic in the Strait of Hormuz. These kinds of things could potentially have an impact um, on this gas price issue uh, in the end. So both of these things are they're sort of interrelated and they're both things uh, to watch uh, going forward. Um, let me now talk just a little bit about sort of the implications here in terms of the power balance, um, uh, what kind of scenarios we can see in Washington between the White House and Congress, and then some policy implications very quickly. Um, first of all, there's a pretty strong chance that we'll have divided government. Uh, again, uh, in, in starting in 2013. Uh, you know, our most likely scenario right now would be uh, Obama as president, uh, and then potentially you would have a divided Congress um, where the House uh, goes, uh, stays Republican. Um, but the Senate right now uh, is, is, is a bigger question. Um, you know, I think if, if you look at what's happened, say, you know, say three months ago, if you looked at the Senate races, um, it looked pretty clear that the Republicans uh, had a very good chance to take, uh, take control of the Senate uh, next year. Uh, one third of the Senate, uh, along with all of the House uh, members, uh, go up for uh, election uh, this year. And the Democrats have to defend 23 seats. Uh, the Republicans have to defend only 10. Or at least that's the way it looked three months ago. Things have changed a little bit, um, you know, but that is a significant advantage uh, for the Republicans in terms of trying to take back the Senate. Um, if, uh, if Obama is elected president, they need a net gain of four seats to take control. If Romney's elected president, they would need a net gain of, of three seats because the vice president serves as a tie-breaking vote in the Senate. Um, so from that standpoint, it doesn't look that difficult for the Republicans, and there's still a very good chance that they could take control uh, of the Senate. However, there have been some changes. Uh, a, a seat in uh, Maine uh, that belongs uh, to Senator Snow, uh, she's decided to retire. That would look like a very safe Republican seat. Now uh, it looks like uh, the, the most likely winner would be an independent who would most likely caucus with the Democrats in the Senate. Uh, the Republicans are having more difficulty than I think they initially expected in races in Nevada and Massachusetts. Uh, and so it, it's become a little bit harder for them to defend uh, some of the seats that they thought were, were relatively safe. So whereas two, three months ago, it looked like it was pretty safe that the Republicans would be, would be leading the Senate. Now it's not so clear. It's, it's basically a toss up. And we'll have to see how the Senate races go, go forward. A lot of these sort of contested Democratic seats are in uh, so-called swing states, states that um, are where the outcome of you know whether it's going to go to Obama or Romney uh, is not yet uh, clear. And I think the fact that there will be major political battles there will help to sort of determine um, whether or not the Democrats can hold on to those seats uh, in those states. If Obama does very well, that might actually help the, the Senate Democratic candidates uh, going forward. In the House, it looks a bit more clear-cut. Uh, the, the Democrats would have to get a net gain of 25 seats uh, out of uh, out of 435 uh, in order to uh, in order to retain or in order to get a majority. Um, it looks like they will probably make some gains, but um, this year um, redistricting, based on the uh, most recent census, redistricting of, of, elect of uh, election districts uh, for the House takes place. Uh, and it looks like uh, some of the Republicans uh, who came in two years ago uh, in, in districts that were a little bit difficult to hold on to because they had previously been Democratic districts, 
they're probably going to be a little bit safer now um, because of redistricting in, in some states. And so that, that gives the Republicans an advantage uh, going forward. Um, so there is a, a pretty good chance here that we will, see, we will again see divided government uh, in Washington. And I think one critical point with the Senate is that it is highly unlikely you would see, and in fact, you, you almost certainly will not see a situation in which either party uh, has uh, 60 seats. Uh, which would be necessary to uh, to break uh, filibuster, uh, which has been one of the maneuvers that have been used to, to block legislation repeatedly over the last, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a long time Senate practice. It's been used uh, rather aggressively over the last decade by Democrats and Republicans uh, to block legislation that they didn't like. So Senate gridlock um, is still uh, quite likely. Um, and then you know, while you know things will start to settle down as the election ends, um, there's still a lot of tension, I think, between the Democrats and Republicans in Washington. That's not necessarily conducive to sort of, you know, uh, <coughs> conciliation, um, sort of, uh, a compromise. Um, so I think there will still be a lot of difficulty uh, in terms of policy making uh, going forward. Now, domestic policy, I think, is still going to be uh, a very big focus. Uh, for uh, for the president, uh, whoever it is, and for Congress, uh, going forward. Uh, I mean, th that's where most of the you know the American public's attention is uh, primarily. Uh, that's where uh, the focus has been in Washington over the last uh, basically since 2008, um, and that's likely to continue. And I think we will continue to hear a lot about these issues of deficit reduction. Uh, which have been uh, a big issue over the last year and a half, and it is, it's an ongoing issue, it's not resolved, uh, and there's still a lot uh, that needs to be uh, settled in terms of cuts to the budget, uh, in terms of the expiration of uh, the Bush era tax cuts, uh, uh, which happens at the end of this year. The problem is, is that it's not clear that uh, there's a lot of room for uh, compromise between uh, Demo Democrats and Republicans on the surface, at, at, at least, um, but there does seem to be an undercurrent of, of sort of uh, a reluctance by both parties to really address the issues uh, of, of deficit spending, uh, cutting the deficits, dealing with you know, dealing with tax increases. Um, so it's not clear that we're going to have any kind of resolution to these particular problems by the end of this year, um, which means that a lot of these issues will sort of get pushed into 2013 and beyond. And that can have implications for how other policies are developed. So. Issues related to, to you know, you know corporate-related issues, uh, issues like immigration, um, it can put a lot of, it, it can make it harder for Congress and for the White House to focus on those issues if they're still focusing on uh, and, and spending a lot of political capital on these issues related to deficit reduction. And that's something to consider, at least in terms of, you know, how this will will sort of affect the agenda in Washington uh, going forward. Um, let me turn now uh, just a little bit, a little bit to foreign policy. Um, you know, there's, during the campaign, there's a lot of rhetorical contrast. Um, sure, sorry, uh, yeah, sure. Um, th there's a lot of sort of rhetorical contrast out there between Democrats and Republicans. In the end, uh, regardless of who uh, becomes president, the differences are probably going to be relative, uh, are probably going to be much smaller than the rhetoric uh, suggests. So. You know there will be a, you know, a lot of rhetoric, particularly out you know out of the out of the Romney side as they attack the White House uh, on particular issues. Um, but it's just sort of it's sort of critical to think about how you know rhetoric often doesn't match the policies once the president uh, actually takes office. Now, when it comes to uh, you know sort of East Asia, uh, I think whether it is a Democratic or Republican administration. We will see increased attention to, to East Asia, particularly on issues related to China. Um, that seems to be a, a, a big part of the administration's focus uh, going forward. Um, Secretary of State Clinton has sort of, in, in recent months and speeches, has laid out uh, a, a policy which focuses much more attention uh, to issues in East Asia, uh, especially as Afghanistan and Iraq issues are starting to wind down. Um, and even though it's likely she will not be Secretary of State uh, in 2013, um, it is likely that that policy, uh, certainly under Obama, and probably to a, to a certain degree under Romney, will continue. 
uh, in part because China is getting much more attention. It's getting a lot of attention from the Romney campaign uh, in terms of some of his foreign policy speeches. Um, uh, and uh, the Obama administration is also putting a lot more uh, focus uh, on, on China as well. Um, you know, the, the, I think what we will see, what we would see in a second Obama administration is probably a lot of focus on sort of regional diplomacy um, with, uh, you know, uh, with countries in Southeast Asia, uh, with South Korea and Japan. Um, and then we would also see sort of movements on, uh, on economic integration or economic cooperation uh, and trade policy like TPP, which is I think a big part uh, of the administration's uh, push in terms of foreign policy uh, in the region, uh, and there's still a very strong commitment to that. Um, now, I think for both the Obama administration and a, and a Romney administration, uh, we would see more tension with China going forward. I mean, the trajectory of the U.S.-China relationship does look more negative uh, over the long term because of tensions over a, a, a number of issues. Um, whether it's trade and currency issues that have been a problem uh, uh, for years, it's the cybersecurity issue, which is becoming a bigger issue uh, between uh, the two countries. Uh, and then also, I think, sort of regional security issues, where you're starting to see countries in, in Southeast Asia in particular uh, uh, become uh, more interested in dialogue with the U.S. on, on security issues. Um, uh, and, you know, with sort of China being, uh, being the main issue for them, uh, in these discussions. Um, I think uh, with Romney, uh, many of the issues are similar, but the campaign rhetoric has been much sharper and stronger. I think the Obama administration, had, we've seen more uh, sort of signs of confrontation uh, between, uh, between the U.S. and China uh, in the last year. Romney's rhetoric has been uh, uh, similarly confrontational. Uh, and you know, he said from day one he would label China as a currency manipulator. Uh, for example, and he, in, in his sort of his foreign policy outlook, puts a lot in terms of um, you know restrictions that can be put onto trade with China uh, if the U.S. doesn't get terms that it finds uh, acceptable. Um, you know, I think in the end, there's not uh, there won't be too much difference that we would see in a Romney administration versus an Obama administration in the policy with China. Um, but the concern I think regionally will be that the U.S.-China relationship, while they will try and keep it on a you know, relatively good footing, that there will be, you know, risk of sort of a, you know, more negative uh, uh, developments uh, going forward between the two sides. Let me finally just make a, a couple of quick comments about the relationship with Japan, because I think this focus, in this focus uh, on uh, East Asia, the U.S. government will continue to see Japan uh, as an important ally uh, uh, in, in that, in, in sort of, in, in that effort. Um, but I think there still will be concern, at least in the short term, uh, just in terms of you know, the working relationship between the U.S. and Japanese governments. I think um, you know, for, for a while there's been this concern about uh, the, uh, the concern about sort of the, the, the continual changes in government uh, uh, that we've seen uh, in Japan and sort of the, the political uh, uncertainty. Uh, and so this year's issues with SNAP, the, the, the possibility of SNAP elections um, has made it difficult, I think, for policymakers in Washington uh, in terms of trying to, to, to sort of figure out, you know, what kind of commitments they can get um, uh, from the Japanese government and, and will those commitments stick. So that can be an issue, uh, I think, going forward in terms of trying to advance various issues. Now, TPP uh, will be, I think, continue to be a big part uh, of, of the bilateral dialogue, um, but it will be a, a pretty slow process. Now, I think it will help uh, just the fact that the TPP process in general, while the U.S. wants to move forward uh, uh, with it, is probably also going to be relatively slow uh, in terms of its uh, in terms of advancing forward. Uh, why don't I stop there? And then I mean, there are plenty of other issues <laughs> that, can, that can, we can discuss here. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I've always pointed out that unlike Japanese universities, we want to devote a lot of time to Q&A. Uh, but th thank you very much, both of you. Uh, we'll sit down for the Q&A. How uh, do we move the mic? Oh, just okay. Okay. We're going to move the
Hello, my name is Brian Minahan. I work for Sankoban. That is a French company living in Japan, but I'm an American. Um, I came in late, so I'm not sure whether I missed your addressing this or not, but what about the factor of money influencing the election going forward this year? And I want to ask this from a, a specific this election point of view, and then your opinions on long term. Um, you know, we have super PAC money, um, and I, I forget when the Supreme Court made that decision that made that possible, but uh, could one of you comment on uh, Obama's fundraising and access to money, or Romney and his personal funds and, and how that's going to weigh in? And so that's the, the, the short term. Longer term, the, the overall influence of, of money on elections in general, uh, given the Supreme Court decision. Thank you. I think it's work. This long? This is our first presidential election with super PACs. Um, you know, because Maybe for so long, the viewers, participants who are not familiar with the term, could you just in one minute explain what super PAC is? Okay, basically what it allows is groups that are technically unaffiliated with the candidate are allowed to basically raise and spend as much money as they want um, without any limitations. It's a little more complicated. There's different IRS codes you, you're still under. But, but overall, it allows unlimited spending by people with very deep pockets. Um, normally, if you're donating directly to a candidate, there's limitations on how much you can donate. Um, these super PACs are really interesting because even though they're unaffiliated, so you know, Mitt Romney has a super PAC right now. And he's not allowed to tell that super PAC, this very sort of rich organization that runs campaign ads. He can't tell them what ads to run or not. But he can go out and fundraise for the super PAC. Um, so the candidate can fundraise for the PAC but then can't control the PAC. And the, and the idea that the Supreme Court said is that these are basically independent groups that want to raise money however they want, and if they want to talk about who should be president, um, you know, they're allowed. It's not bribery, which is what we worry about with sort of both campaign contributions, because nobody's giving money directly to the candidate. They're just spending money to, to say a message, and their message is, you know, elect Mitt Romney or elect Barack Obama. And Barack Obama has said that he's going to allow super PACs also, and presumably fundraise for them, um, to work for him. So this is going to be a billion dollar election, uh, you know, pretty much. And, and if you have any stocks in media companies in, in the United States, it, it's probably going to be good for you, uh, you know, because that's where that money's going to go, um, you know, ads, ads, ads. So we'll see. I mean, clearly what this kind of means is that campaign finance reform in the United States is, is non-existent, um, that there's really no limitations now. Everything's, everything's off. They're going to spend as much money as they want. No one's going to take federal matching money anymore because it limits how much you can spend, and no one's going to put themselves in that position. Uh, the other thing with political fundraising in the United States is the advent of the internet, and the ability to go out there for candidates and raise money. Um, Barack Obama used this very well um, in 2008. Um, I'm sure that's going to become part of the future. You can raise money in very small amounts from a lot of people, um, and that, that had really helped Barack Obama, I think, in 2008. Who knows if it'll help. Uh, Republicans. I don't know if Romney's going to spend that much of his own money. I don't think he's going to have to, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of money out there. I, I just add that I think for this election cycle, what, what we've seen so far is, is Republicans, I think, are doing a better job of organizing super PACs. Uh, and, you know, a, as Paul said, you know, uh, Obama has, you know, you know, now said he will accept, you know, you know, he will. You know, sort of endorse super PAC money, um, but he, he he did it much later than the Republicans. I think if you look at this is one of the reasons I think why uh, at least when you look at the House races, probably um, the, 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 this is another advantage for the Republicans. Um, and I think you know in the in the election campaign it will help Romney probably more than it will help uh, Obama. And I think for Romney it, this may be uh, important because I mean there have been some suggestions. Uh, during the primary process, at least, that Romney has had a harder time getting these small-level donations uh, that Paul was talking about, um, and so super PAC money, um, you know, will be you know very important, I think, uh, from from that perspective. And also, uh, don't forget too, in terms of, of the super PACs, that labor 
um, unions are allowed unlimited donations to these super PACs. So it's not just corporations that are going to be doing this. And labor is really fired up this year. Um, so because of various state issues that have happened under Republican governors, for example. So I think you're going to see the Democrats will not be underfunded this year. Let's put it that way. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the qu my question is, uh, how, you, uh, what is your view how the Republicans managed to split after a long uh, process of the, the, the election uh, within uh, Republicans? Um, yes, I understand that the long process will warm up the party and the, uh, the new, the get the interest and the, uh, the, you know, uh, make the candidate competitive against the uh, uh, Democrats. However, it, it may cause a kind of a split in the in the uh, re Republican. How they how they view, how they make a reconcile or uh, the, who will be the, the running mate if the Romney won or what is it? Well, I think to a certain extent, what we will see, you know, if you if you look at the fact that Santorum especially has has gathered a lot of delegates, and Gingrich also uh, has, has gathered some, that, that I think will help them in terms of, of trying to have a, a, a seat at the table at, at the convention as they're coming up with the, with the party platform uh, that will be endorsed there. Um, and so I think you know, they, will, they will work to reach out, you know, Romney's side will work to reach out to the conservatives in part because he really needs that conservative base uh, during the election to be energized. Um, and there's a risk for him if he ignores them during the convention uh, that they won't turn out on election day. So that I think, you know, there 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 are incentives for Romney to work with them. But I think, you know, just by virtue of the, the gains that they've made and the pri that the more conservative candidates have made in the prim in the primaries, I think you will see that kind of interaction between the different camps. I think also um, the Republicans do want to make sure that the Tea Party uh, groups feel like they're also being uh, included. And I think what we're starting to see is the Tea Party sort of leaders. The Tea Party is not sort of one large group. It's, it's, it's a number of different groups. But we're starting to see leaders of that movement start to say that they will, at, at the very least, that they will accept Romney, if, you know, but that they will support Romney. You know, they will support the Republican candidate in the general election um, because you know, they simply, be, uh, you know, if nothing else, they dislike Obama more. Um, but I think you will see the Republicans work to reach out to the Tea Party. But I think longer term, these are divisions that I think will remain, and you know, regardless of whether Romney wins or loses, those divisions will still be there. And I think one implication that you could see in terms of if Romney's president working with a with Congress, particularly the House Republicans, uh, many of whom were sort of Tea Party supported, uh, are Tea Party supported candidates, um, you could see Romney facing uh, very strong challenges from. Uh, House Republicans on some of his fiscal policy uh, items that they may not see as being conservative enough. So they'll work to reconcile during the convention, but this is going to be a longer term issue, I think, uh, for the party. Yeah, and the other thing to look at with um, the vice presidential choice, uh, you know, I think they will reconcile. But remember, in the United States, we don't hold one election, we hold 51 elections. Um, you know, in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. And of those 51, only about 13 matter. Right, because we know how all the other states are going to vote. I, you know, I'll make a prediction that California will vote for Barack Obama and Texas will vote for whoever the Republican nominee is. And, and I'm, I'll put a lot of money on that. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, it'll be, it'll be close. But, uh, yeah. So we know all those states. So the question is the swing states, Florida, Ohio, um, Virginia. And I think the vice presidential choice is going to be really targeted to those states. That's why somebody like Marco Rubio in Florida. Um, would be you know significant. Rob Portman in Ohio, um, choosing somebody who is sort of from that state as a way of trying to secure um, the swing state vote. I think that's what you're going to look at with the VP choice. Is it true that Biden is going to be vice president of Democrats? Despite what many Democrats want, I think that's true. <laughs> Yes, uh, Elaine Nadaya, and I'd like to ask, what do you think about the effect of the Occupy Wall Street movement on, on all of this? And will it bring out more young people, both 
Democrats and Republicans will bring out more young people because people feel they have more of a say. Or how do you see this? I think to a certain degree you may see some turnout energized on the Democratic side by by the Occupy movements uh, from last year. Um, I think, I mean, you know, certainly the, the act, their activity is, is down is much lower than it was at the time, and I, and I think. If you look at sort of their activism, it's not quite as strong as that of, say, the Tea Party uh, and their influence in the Republican Party. But at the same time, I think the Democrats have worked to try and bring the Tea, uh, bring the Occupy movement sort of more into, you know, into the Democratic fold. Make it uh, uh, sort of to try and, and tap into that energy to a certain degree. I think, you know, and from that standpoint, you may have uh, some. Some more enthusiasm that's generated by that, but the Occupy movement did have a, a you know a, a strain of it that was sort of you know it wasn't just upset at, at Republicans; it was upset at politicians across the spectrum and at Wall Street, and oftentimes you know didn't differentiate between Democrats and Republicans on on, on issues related to uh, related to business and the economy. So I, I think there really are limits in terms of how much they're actually going to sort of see sort of capitalizing. On I mean, first of all, you know, young people's turnout's going to be down this year, um, and you're, gonna, you're not going to see 2008 again, where you saw at least a little bit of a spike in youth turnout, and that's bad for Barack Obama, I think, because those were his part of his core voters. I'm um, just talking to young people in the United States; they're really disillusioned right now. They really don't think they have either party on their side. Um, the Occupy movement, you know, I think really is sort of a non-factor. Um, they're not organized really politically. The only problem for Democrats will be if Occupy tries to make um, the Democratic National Convention, you know, Chicago in 1968, and, and so some people are a little bit worried about that, and it would be a backlash, I think, um, against the Democrats if if that happened. But I don't even know if they're organized enough to really to really pull that off or to do that. Uh, my name is Nao Yukiharao of Japan Economic Foundation. Uh, I have a question about a possible consequence of uh, U.S. presidential election upon its uh, fiscal policy. Uh, if Romney is elected, uh, Republicans uh, with uh, much influence for the Tea Party will be enthusiastic uh, for reducing fiscal uh, deficit, and then the, uh, that would have negative impact on the U.S. economy. Well, I think that I, I think you're right. Certainly, that you will see um, that you will see a, a sort of a, a good degree. If Romney's president, you will see you know sort of Tea Party backed members of Congress really pushing for uh, significant spending cuts, uh, tax reductions as well. Romney has said that he supports uh, this uh, also, but once the election's over. It's really not clear that the political will is there, apart from I mean some some you know people who very strongly believe in, in these kinds of reductions. It's not clear that the political will is there amongst the leadership um, in Congress uh, and in the White House um, to really address these kinds of cuts. There are, for example, automatic spending cuts uh, that were agreed to last year, which are supposed to come into effect um, in the absence of of major of major cuts. It doesn't appear that anybody's very enthusiastic about about making those kinds of cuts. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know the Bush tax cuts are set to expire. Um, there's not a whole lot of enthusiasm, I think, right now for for that either, except when you talk with with you know many Democrats when it comes to the you know the sort of top level uh, tax cuts and, and sort of having those expire. Um, so it, it's not really clear that that the will is there, even if you have sort of combines. Republican White House and Republican dominated House and even Republican uh, dominated Senate, uh, because you know they will be start they will start looking ahead to the uh, to the 2014 midterm elections and those and, and you know, deficit reductions the kinds of spending cuts that would be necessary will have implications for that as well so I think that will also factor into their thinking. Yeah, I agree. I, I look at Congress a lot too, but it's not just the presidential election, but what's going to happen in Congress. Um, it's hard to see a situation 
where the Republicans can do whatever they want. Um, they're not going to get 60 votes in the Senate. I, I think they will actually take the Senate, but I think it'll be very narrow. Uh, maybe one or two, one or two seats. Just just looking at open seats and things like that, it's very hard for Democrats to defend. But they won't have 60, so the Democrats will filibuster whatever they want. Um, so you're going to have gridlock. You could argue that the, the worst thing to happen for the Republican Party would be to take the presidency in both houses of Congress. Um, because then you can predict a crushing defeat in 2014. Because all the divisions within the Republicans are going to start coming out. And if you're John Boehner, this is a nightmare. Um, because you're expected to govern. And um, there's such a division within the Republicans in the House of Representatives in particular. And over this very issue, sort of deficit reduction. And I don't know if it's possible for them to sort of organize around one policy should they actually be in charge to try to pass that policy. So who knows, but I've watched Congress more than the president now. I had a follow-up question about the, uh, the uh, money. Uh, are there any uh, implications beyond uh, of the super PACs beyond the fact that this will be a very, very expensive election? Uh, you said that the, you mentioned that the, uh, there's, there's no, you're not supposed to coordinate with the candidates. Will that affect the, uh, uh, will that, what, what kind of effect will that have with the tone of the uh, um, debate, the tone of the, uh, um, the rhetoric, or will that have any real uh, policy implications? Or will they just coordinate like, with like, eye contact and they get better at it as they go on? I don't think there'll be policy implications, but um, you know, we haven't had a general election with super PACs yet, so we don't know how they're going to act. We've had a primary with super PACs, and we've never seen a primary like this before. Um, candidates don't tend to be as nasty as super PACs, it turns out. They make arguments that candidates haven't made before. So that this carries over to the general election, um, I think your right question is a great one. Um, you know, you could see some really, really nasty ads, and it could contribute to the overall really negative political discourse in the United States, making both sides even angrier with each other um, than they are right now. So this could get very, very ugly. Because you know, if Republicans are willing to say this about other Republicans, imagine what they're willing to say about Democrats, right? I, I also would like to challenge the idea of it's an expensive campaign, because no. 2010, apparently, total advertising expenditures in the U.S. were 131 billion dollars. You know, so basically, you're spending, let's say, each candidate spending two billion. Let's add another three billion. I mean, <laughs> compared to, it's a pretty important buy. Uh, I think if you compare it to launching a new soap or shampoo, uh, it's, it's. I mean, it's not that much money for a large economy. So, is it really expensive? Uh, if you want to do, engineer a large takeover, if you're a corporate chieftain and you, know, you hope to become the CEO of an even bigger company, once you've paid investment banking fees, legal fees, accounting fees, uh, you can be north of a, and um, underwriting fees, you can also be north of a billion dollar, and all you get is you're CEO of a bigger company, and it's really not much compared to being president of the United States. So I think it's still a fairly good deal. Yeah, if you talk about absolute numbers, right. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at who gets to spend um, and who gets to speak, I mean, I think that's the problem because it allows people with a lot of money or laborers with a lot of money to have an incredibly loud voice and drown out anybody else. So it's not necessarily that the elections are too expensive, but when you open up the donations that super PACs have, you've really amplified certain voices. Um, Let me ask you a follow-up question on this. Okay, technically, indeed, you could, regu you could regulate it, but in the end, one very important aspect of media spending is getting support from some media. In other words, Fox News, for practical purposes, supports the Republican Party. Uh, some media outlets support the Democrats. That's been the case for a long time. You can go back to the Hearst Press. That's obviously something that, because of the First Amendment, cannot be regulated. You can say, well, you know, Fox News now has to be objective. Well, the fact is that people on Fox News say, print what they want. Uh, so is there, e even if you stop the super PAC, you still get that issue of the ability to buy media outlets <coughs> one way or the other. I mean, I see your point, and I agree there's a problem, but I just don't see how you can deal with it in the context of a country that has, fortunately, the First Amendment. Yeah, 
I mean, you know, the only point that I would make is that it just sort of going on the sort of absolute versus versus relative terms is that, you know, the public is sort of accustomed to, and, and I think politicians are accustomed to a certain level of spending. As you move higher, it, it causes a sort of increased levels of, of concern or in some cases outrage. Um, and we've had sort of waves where campaign finance reform suddenly becomes a very big deal. Now, a lot of events sort of have to happen sort of at the same time to make that something that would become a big campaign issue or something that Congress would spend an awful lot of time dealing with. But I think one of the things we don't know yet is just how, you know, if you see a, you know, a, a significant jump in, in the spending through super PACs, how, how does the public react? How do politicians react as, as a result? You know, do you then see some sort of attempt to, uh, to reform the system? And, and the public wouldn't, you know, in absolute terms, yes, they, they may say, yeah, it's, it's not that big a, big a deal. But when they look at previous campaigns and they look at sort of the campaign finance rules that were set up, there are plenty of people who don't, who think there should be no campaign finance rules. But for those who do, um, this will sort of add to the level of, of, of you know, irritation that you know, the, the rules have sort of bypassed consistently over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, in the Senate, I wonder what you see as the possibility of the Republicans again shooting themselves in the foot the way they did in, the, in, in Nevada in 2010, i.e. bringing some freak as their candidate as opposed to a more rational candidate. So far we haven't seen that, and we've had some primaries. Uh, however, you know, I kind of thought the Tea Party was dead, to be honest with you. Uh, I thought the movement had spent and, and had had their day, and they don't have a lot of organizations. There was an election in Ohio um, you know, during Super, Super Tuesday, and everybody paid attention to the presidential election. But what people didn't notice is Gene Schmidt lost her primary election, um, and no one saw that coming. And she was opposed by a Tea Party candidate. So they managed to knock off uh, you know, a, a Republican that nobody was even looking at. Um, she's a member of Congress, I'm sorry, from uh, sort of the Southern Ohio um, area. Um, a pretty Republican district. She would have been reelected. It was pretty safe. He might be also the one, the person who defeated her, whose name I can't remember right now because nobody knew about him um, at the time. But so that was a little bit shocking um, when that happened. And it shows that the Tea Party's still out there. And who knows, in some primary that we're not watching out there, they've got some Senate candidate somewhere. Um, who's going to, I, said, I don't know, Luger, right? Luger's vulnerable, and that's a, probably a very safe seat if he gets renominated. but if the Tea Party could take him out. Um, the overall effect is also to shift the Republicans to the right because of the fear of the primaries. I mean, I'd also sort of, if you look at the, at the main race, um, you know, the, the Republican candidate, I mean, the, I think there was a sense even before Angus King, the independent uh, former governor, uh, who now looks to be the favorite, at, at least at the moment, um, before before he came into the race, there was already a sense, I think, of optimism that the Democratic candidate would have an advantage over the Republican candidate, in part because you know, there was a sense that the candidate would be fairly weak. Um, and so suddenly you had a situation, as, as I was saying, where a where, you know, safe seat suddenly becomes one that the Democrats uh, can either pick up on their own or through, you know, through working with King you know, that way. But I'd also say, I mean, Luger, uh, in Indiana is probably a, a, another case uh, where you could see a, a, a challenge, but uh, there's also the chance that he survives uh, that. And even if he has to shift to the shift to the right a bit, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's he's vulnerable uh, in that scene. Uh, Sam Jameson, uh, an EVD such as the group. Is there less or more racial discrimination in the United States today than there was at the last election? especially in view of the fact that the president was forced to uh, issue a copy of his birth certificate. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, I that think... That was a racial issue, of course, you know, the birth certificate. Well, I think, I mean, the the issue of, of is you know, the, the, the sort of issue of, of Obama's birth certificate, I think, you know, that issue at least probably will not be, you know, will not play out significantly in this campaign. Um, I think that issue, 
you know, that, that issue came up uh, quite a bit sort of around the time of the midterm election. It's, it's basically, it's, it's died down with, with, a, with a few exceptions, um, I would say. Now there has been, I think, a lot of concern about voter ID laws in, in some states, uh, in particular which people, you know, would, in which people would argue uh, discriminate against. The voter ID law, basically laws that have come into place requiring uh, some kind of identification for voters uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be presented on election day. Um, there have been several states that have been pursuing this uh, and some states that have adopted it. Um, and there has been, uh, you know, the, the, the argument um, has been that these uh, unfairly discriminate against minorities and particularly against uh, uh, poor people uh, as well. Um, and so I think you know, that issue isn't gaining, I, I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily gaining a lot of national uh, attention just yet. I think you know, I, I, I've seen, you know, at least from, from, from where I sit here, I've seen some coverage of the issue. Um, you know, and, and I think on a state-by-state -state basis, um, it's being challenged in, in certain cases. Um, that's, I think, probably the, sort of the, the manifestation of, of that that we've seen the most uh, during this election cycle. Uh, so far, and I think you know it, it will be you know concern, especially I think as as um, the Democratic Party in particular, as they look at sort of the mechanics of the election uh, in some states. Um, I think they feel, of course, them at a much at a greater disadvantage than would Republicans. And remember, I mean, no mainstream candidate has raised this issue. In fact, they're staying away from it as much as possible. Uh, you know, Barack Obama's citizenship, because everybody knows it's a loser. It's a fringe issue. So I'm not sure how much it says about the United States um, that, it, that it become sort of an issue. If, if it took off, then maybe we could make that statement. Uh, but it really, really is a fringe issue. The media plays it up because it's fun for them. But you know, I, I think most it doesn't affect most voters uh, at all on this. But the voter ID, the other thing to look at there is that, look, 90% more of African American voters are going to vote for Barack Obama, are going to vote for the Democratic candidate. And the Republicans know this. There is a racial aspect to it, perhaps. It's also a political aspect. Um, you know, if the Republicans can, draw, can drive down minority voting, that's good for them in terms of getting elected. And I think that might be more important to them um, than sort of the discrimination aspect of it. I think Julia did Yes. Um, at the race, uh, you, uh, you uh, the, the, the Tea Party was seen as a predominantly white movement. Um, and it looks, when you look yeah, at the pictures, yes. it has, 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 it does, does the uh, um, Republican Party look whiter as, uh, as, the, uh, as, a as a result, or do you think that there's a, there's a um, non-white in Indian nation from the Republican Party? Would that be a factor? Yeah, I well, I, you know, you have an African American president, right? So it's hard to look to, to, to look at this right now because you know, African American voters, even if they don't agree with everything that Barack Obama stands for, are going to be Democrats right now and are going to try to make sure that the first African American president gets reelected. So yes, that makes the Republican Party look very, very, very white. It's been very, very white for a long time. Now. Um, how about uh, the, the broad? Much, much larger uh, We've seen it shifting a little bit, right? And, and the, the problem is talking about Hispanic voters. You know, Hispanic is an American invented word, right? For um, you know, yeah, but it, it, so, but it includes you know Cuban Americans. Um, you know, it includes Mexican Americans. And talk to Cuban Americans and Mexican Americans. You'll see that they don't really consider themselves, uh, you know, uh, of the same ethnic background. Um, and they don't all vote the same way. Um, you know, of course, one of the other things you're seeing is first generation versus next generation. You see different voting behavior as people are in the United States for a longer period of time. Um, you know, the, our most recent immigrants tend to be Mexican American, and recent immigrants almost always side with the Democratic Party um, because they think they're more favorable um, to the needs of uh, people that tend to be poor, the recent immigrants. So I think you're seeing that. Republicans have been planning for years to try to somehow go out and grab the Hispanic vote. Um, there is some speculation that President Bush was somewhat successful with this in 2004. But the poll numbers aren't showing a great movement. So no, I, I think 
for the near future, the Republican Party will remain a mainly white party. Let me follow up since we are kind of in the race and ethnicity class uh, on religion. Um, well, there, there are two things. One thing is striking if you look at it historically, of course, is that you have a Catholic candidate who's gotten a lot of evangelical votes. You know, in 1960, I mean, it was a problem for Jack Kennedy to get Protestants to vote for him. Um, but there's also been, I mean, the Republican campaign has had a very religious slash Christian slant to it. Um, Romney had to mention that he believes in, in Christ the Redeemer. Uh, they've all talked a lot, of, not only about religion, but really about Christianity. Uh, Bob Putnam had a recent article in Foreign Affairs with a co-author, whose name I unfortunately forgot, uh, pointing out that this may actually have been costly for the Republicans uh, because it's alienated a lot of voters, uh, and it's also been bad in that it's identified some so, so religion with the right. Uh, how, how does the religious thing play, both in the primary, I mean, where you have a lifelong Roman Catholic, uh, a recent convert to Catholicism, uh, Ingrich, uh, and a Mormon? And then how does this play in the general election, both Christ conservative Christian versus the rest of the electorate, uh, very religious voters, regardless of their denomination, versus the rest of the electorate? What's the religious angle? to all this? Well, I think, you know, I mean, you're right. In the, in the primary, we've seen quite a bit of focus on this. I think in part because uh, we've seen, there have been periods where uh, Santorum especially uh, has been talking about uh, you know, issues that I think uh, resonate with a lot of the sort of the religious and political advocacy, advocacy groups in particular. Um, social issues uh, in particular, uh, abortion, uh, gay marriage, uh, some of these issues. And so, I mean, I, I think to a certain extent, you know, it, it will, you know, it, it's important in part, I think, you know, on the, on the right that they, that they brought this out because, you know, this social conservative uh, sort of element of the Republican Party is a pretty big you know, part of that base. I mean, you do have economic conservatives, you do have uh, you know, conservatives who focus more on, on national security and foreign policy issues, but the you know, social conservatives are a very large group. So for any, you know, for any candidate, it would have been inevitable that they would, I think that they would have been talking about these issues, uh, you know, during, during this campaign. Now, how that translates in the general election, I think, you know, to a certain extent, it, it's good, I mean, this isn't gonna come up quite as much as an issue in the general election campaign. I think in part because, you know, Obama is unlikely to talk about, about these issues, or to bring these issues up in too much detail, um, you, know, unless, uh, you know, unless presented with, with the questions. I mean, that was sort of, you know, it, when, during the 2008 campaign, he typically was talking about these issues in reaction to questions, not so much in terms of, you know, putting these issues out there himself. Um, and Romney as well, I, you know, I imagine there will be some uh, discussion of this in part to appeal to, 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 to show the social conservative base that he's still thinking about these issues. I'm sure will come up in the convention uh, quite a bit. Um, but Romney, as I was saying, Romney's campaign will primarily be about the economy, uh, I think, especially if there is still questions about economic performance going forward. And I think these issues will, will be a, a bit more secondary from, from that aspect. So while I do think that there will be quite a bit of conversation about this, um, it won't come up quite as much. And, you know, I think, you know, there will be some independent and moderate voters who, who don't, they don't focus on these issues. That, and in some cases, they don't like, you know, the candidates focusing on these issues. And it, and it may, you know, they may not be quite as responsive to Romney as a result of these issues start to dominate uh, the discussion. Um, but again, it is important, I think, for, on the Republican side, in terms of shoring up the base ahead of the vote, if it, it appears to social conservatives that they're not being treated seriously by the Romney campaign, that can be you know, a big problem in terms of trying to get out the vote on election day. There is one interesting religious issue um, that could come up. And I don't know how much it got covered here in Japan, but the contraception issue. Um, with uh, sort of healthcare coverage and the rulemaking from the Obama administration telling sort of particularly um, religious affiliated groups that hire those that aren't of their own faith 
that they have to um, provide coverage for contraceptives. Um, the Catholic Church in particular has had a big problem with this, and you have organizations like Catholic Hospitals and Catholic Charities um, that, have, that have opposed this, and the Catholic bishops have been fairly united in opposition to the Obama administration in this. It's an open question about whether Catholic voters are going to follow their church and therefore sort of oppose um, you know, President Obama because of this really kind of quietly, I mean, Catholic voters helped President Obama, supporting him in 2008. If he loses that support, it could be difficult um, for him moving forward. Um, but, you know, so we're not sure about that. Also remember, you know, that the, the very organizations that are complaining about this, Catholic Charities, for example, tend to be fairly liberal organizations um, with our sort of other beliefs. It might not be the best idea to have offended um, you know, those organizations, particularly if what happens, and what probably will happen if this moves forward, is uh, they're going to have to drop health care coverage for their employees and pay a huge fine, which they can't necessarily afford. It did look like a little bit of an unforced error on the part of the Obama administration and could play out. Catholics make up 25% um, of the electorate in the United States. Yes, but they don't vote their church in the, in the voting group. Uh, but if they perceive this as an attack on the church, it's not the contraception issue. You can have plenty of Catholics out there who use contraceptives and think it's fine, but don't like the idea of the administration telling um, their religious group what they have to do. That's Sort of in a similar vein to that and another question that was asked earlier. My name is Mike. I'm the treasurer of Democrats Abroad Japan, actually. Uh, I think Republicans took away a lesson in 2010 that when they you know, won all their seats that they received a green light to pursue their economic and social agenda very aggressively. And I think they've miscalculated which is why you see all these anti-union bills energizing people in Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, uh, and these vaginal ultrasound bills. And I'm just wondering, as I see it, I could be wrong, but as I see it, they're damaging their hopes right now, but they can't stop themselves because you can't be a successful Republican without putting on this ideological straitjacket. Well, you know, I, I think yeah, this is certainly going to come up as I think as an issue in the congressional campaigns in particular, you know. But I think when it comes, I, I think what we'll have to see is just how much, uh, you know, the economy plays in in this campaign. I, I, you know, I wonder about you know how much the Obama campaign, uh, especially on the social issue uh, side, I, on on the union issues, I think you know the Obama campaign will probably you know, move pretty aggressively. Uh, in attacking Republicans on that, and I think you know congressional candidates as well uh, will we'll move on that on that front. Um, you know, especially if you do have sort of a lot of, of, of labor support. I mean, with the caveat that um, you know because you know, labor unions you know come under so so much attack from Republicans, and it you know and, and moderates and independents don't always look favorably upon unions. I think there would be some moderation there, but I also don't think you know Obama will necessarily bring up social issues. Um, uh, too much on, on his own. You think he has to, though? I mean, it's like they're shooting themselves in the foot. <laughs> well, I think, but I think, you know, when it, that, I think it will play more in, in the congressional races than, than the presidential uh, campaign. Because I think in the presidential campaign, you tend to be much more focused in terms of, you know, where are the issues headed, what is the agenda, and what's the top thing, what is the top issue that, that the candidates are focused on, that the media is focused on. If it's the economy, um, you know, I think, you know, you will see some in terms of you know the you know these issues uh, about unions uh, and the like. But again, probably moderated a little bit because uh, I think there is still a concern, uh, you know, in terms of the national campaign that you, you can alienate some independent and moderate voters uh, uh, by talking about that uh, talking about that too much. Balancing that with the need to appeal to uh, labor unions um, who seem very active uh, during this election. So. There's just one other issue I want to make sure we cover, and that is um, health care reform. Um, huge issue in the United States, and next week it's back in the news because we're going to have a historically long argument before the Supreme Court over the constitutionality of health care reform. The decision will come down in June, um, so only a month or so before both parties' conventions of this year, and it'll bring it to the forefront. Now, I'm not sure what it means 
Meaning, you know, let's say that the Supreme Court votes to uphold um, the health care reform law. And, you know, if that happens, that means at least, you know, one Republican judge is going to have to cross over. And if that happens, you'll have more. I mean, if, if Anthony Kennedy, Anthony Kennedy is the most powerful man in the United States, by the way. Um, because he's, he's, Anthony Kennedy, he is the fifth vote on the Supreme Court. And where Anthony Kennedy goes, so goes the Supreme Court. I'm relatively sure that if Kennedy's going to vote to uphold health care, Roberts is going to join because of the technicalities of how the Supreme Court works. If the Chief Justice is in the majority, the Chief Justice assigns the opinion. And Roberts will want to control the opinion. So he'll probably join. So it's not going to be 5-4, it's going to be 6-3. American people don't understand necessarily how the Supreme Court works. So it's going to look like an overwhelming majority of the Supreme Court said that what Barack Obama, Barack Obama did was constitutional. Um, and, you know, therefore, what are the Republicans talking about? Um, so it, it could really help, I think, the president if it turns out that way. On the other hand, it could remind Republicans about the importance of Supreme Court nominations and make them really fired up about, you know, even if a conservative doesn't like Mitt Romney, realizing that if President Obama gets reelected, he's going to have four years. Those justices, the conservative ones, Antonin Scalia, some, are old, um, or they're getting older. They could be replaced in the next four years. So you know, it could play in, in both directions. We don't know. Now, if it gets overturned, does that help the Republican argument, saying that see, um, this administration, President Obama, doesn't follow the Constitution? You know, making their argument. So I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but I think it's going to be very significant because um, it's going to be the lead story in all the newspapers when this decision comes down. We're all going to be watching for this. So it's going to be big news in June, and that's right before the convention. State versus federal. Well, I think he had a question over here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he said the difference between Romney Care and Obamacare. And I think the difference is, you know, Romney Care is in Massachusetts. It's state. Um, you know, Obamacare, as they call it, is, is federal. In American law, there is a difference between what states can do and um, what the federal government can do. You could make the argument without being inconsistent that it's constitutional in Massachusetts and not um, under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I, my name is Tom Dreeves. I'm, I'm a lawyer in town and, and kind of a, a disappointed uh, Republican, uh, but, uh, but from a, green, from a, a blue state. Um, it looks like in this election, you know, there's a, just a lot of unreality. Uh, there, ni neither party is, is, I mean, a lot of, no one is really energized. Maybe that's, from my perspective overall, why it seems that, to me, although Obama should lose, he's going to win because the, Demo the, the Republicans don't really present the contrast. Um, and I think the voters get that as a result of Citizens United. We see an election that's being run by money you know, buy money for money, and, and of course they're spending money to buy influence. Um, the, the Tea Party candidates. We have one more question. Oh, sorry. Be brief. All right. Uh, just okay. So a quick question. So no one's mentioned gender. Um, we talked about an unforced error uh, by Obama with respect to uh, 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 contraceptives, but how did the re Republicans react, and how do you think that's going to affect the attractiveness of, 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 of their candidate in the fall? Well, I, I mean, I think that the, the contraception issue has, I mean, the, the, the anecdotal evidence, at least, I, I haven't seen any polls on this in particular, but it, it does seem to have, um, you know, it, it presents a risk for them in terms of alienating uh, women voters. Uh, if it becomes a big issue, if it remains a big issue, um, uh, it, do, it does present that risk, um, you know, of, of alienation of, of some women voters who would see this, uh, you know, I, I think not just you know, not so much the candidates, but I think you know, in the U.S., the the issue you know took on sort of added dimensions with some of the comments by Rush Limbaugh and other conservative radio hosts, which were you know, I mean, which were you know, the the, the condemnations from the Republican candidates were not or were pretty weak, um, generally speaking. And I think that, you know that there is a risk there uh, in terms of the issue. You know, in the same way, you know, while there is a risk on the Democratic side, I, I, you know, I think you're you're you know. You, you bring up a good point. You know that there is a risk uh, on the Republican side um, from from this particular issue. It won't, you know, won't, won't obviously won't alienate all women, women uh, supporters of the Republican Party. But there is a risk there um, uh, in terms of, you know, 
this particular social issue at least, um, uh, you know, creating a problem for the party. So, quick question. Just one other thing, it's a very good comment though, because women are also a majority of the electorate in the United States. So if they successfully make that argument, if you're, you're right, there could be a real backlash. Yeah. Quick question in the back, yeah. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Gary McCaskill. I'm a uh, student here at Temple University. Um, I, earlier you said something that we kind of glanced over and really, really didn't focus on earlier um, was voting, disenfranchisement of minorities in the voting arena. Um, I'm a Florida citizen and uh, I live here in I live here in Japan. Um, one of the problems is, is that a lot of the uh, a lot of students here at Temple University are young and they are the of, of the age of voting. Um, we do not a lot of students here, including myself, do not obtain or do not have the, uh, the proper identity to be able to, uh, the proper identification to vote. Um, what is the, what do you think is one of the resolutions that could happen for Temple University students to be able to vote in this up and coming election? And also, I'm, I'm probably sure that this is probably part of my, uh, my student government to, to deal with, but how is it that we are able, how, how is it that we can vote in the up and coming election? Well, you're, you're, you're still a U.S. citizen. Uh, you're still from a state. So presumably you were registered um, in that state. You should be able to vote absentee. You know, with, with, the, with the up and coming laws of uh, basically the identification that you would have to show. <laughs> yeah, I understand I, I just want to I just want to get that out because I don't know. This is my first time being in Japan. So. I think it might help. Outstanding. We have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. I don't trust lawyers, but yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the U.S. Embassy. Should have some information for that. Yeah, U.S. Embassy. Do you want to conclude with one or two words? We have one more question. I'm sorry. That was the last question. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to reiterate the importance of the labor issue on this year, because I, I'm not sure if people are, are seeing that. Um, particularly, again, 13 elections for all that matter, at most, in the United States. And one of those states is certainly Ohio. Um, I'm partial, right? But no one's ever won the presidency over the, since 1960 without winning Ohio. And I, it's very difficult. The Democrats could, actually, um, without Ohio. If you put it together, I think they could do it more easily than the Republicans. Um, but there's something that could be on the ballot in Ohio, a very small issue, um, called right to work. And uh, the Republican Party, believe it or not, is doing everything they can to oppose getting this on the ballot, um, in part because they know it's probably the kiss of death for the Republican Party in Ohio because it'll draw union voters out, and they're going to come, and they're going to vote against Republicans. Um, so they've got some of the signatures they need already. It's little things like this when you're analyzing elections that make it hard, because this is really just a statewide issue that you might not even have noticed. It's not even a party thing. But um, if it happens, you know, it, it happened once in 1958. Um, if you go back, Republicans in Ohio, put, or not Republicans actually, the Republican Party opposed it. But again, business groups got right to work on the ballot. Republicans at the time controlled everything in the state of Ohio. They lost everything in that election, 60-40. Um, so you know, things have changed. But that's, I think, um, is, is a sleeper issue out there. And also the organization that Democrats and labor have gotten from this sort of anti-union legislation and their opposition to it in places like Wisconsin, in places like Ohio, um, could be a really strong factor in this election that I would keep an eye on. Um, Paul mentioned uh, earlier, just, uh, he talked a little bit about sort of the, you know, looking at this as, as you know, 51 elections rather than just one election. And I, I just wanted to sort of re-emphasize the importance of looking, during the general election campaign, looking state by state because of the Electoral College, the fact that, you know, it's not a, a direct popular election, it's Electoral College uh, that ultimately determines who's president. Um, and, you know, so right now, while, you, while polls show Romney and Obama quite close in terms of sort of general public opinion, um, when you look state by state, it's a little bit more, uh, Obama has a, has a clearer advantage right now than Romney does. Um, and so I think that that's going to be a key here. 
Um, some of the battleground states, um, you know, states that over the last decade have mattered in, in the elections, like Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, uh, South Carolina, Virginia, um, these will all be important. And in many of these states, uh, the, the poll numbers are trending towards Obama, which gives him quite an advantage, you know, heading into the general election campaign. Now, obviously, the factors that we've discussed tonight can really affect that, um, and it can affect it on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, but if trends stay the way that they are, you could actually see scenarios in which, you know, there are very few states that are, you know, sort of critical in terms of determining uh, the election. Florida, I think, from from start to finish, is going to be one of, one of the most important states uh, to watch. Um, you know, but we'll have to see. Some of the other states, like Pennsylvania and Ohio, may not matter quite as much as they have uh, in in recent years. But it really depends on on where the trends head. Um, so again, this is sort of the key to watch, I think, going forward. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I hope we'll have you back for post-mortem after the election. <laughs> um, so, thanks again. Uh